Good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome once again this morning, Dr. Robin Lee. He is so used to giving these presentations and we rely on him hugely. So lovely, Robin, to have you come and speak to us on Scott Fitzgerald today, one of the most interesting of novelists and a most very interesting period. So thank you. Now, Robin and Danina retired to Hermanus in 2002 after a very busy career, both in academia and in NGO management. Their involvement in the community has been absolutely magnificent. Robin was involved and instrumental in establishing U3A Overberg in 2003, and then he was also influential in the founding of the Amanus History Society in 2012. Robin, wonderful to have you able to talk to us once again. We look forward to hearing what you have to tell us about this very interesting novelist. Thank you. Thank you, Letitia. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Uh, it's a, he's an interesting figure and the novels that he wrote are interesting as well. Uh, sometimes an artist is associated with an age or an artistic movement or a particular event in history. For instance, we talk of the romantic poets or the impressionist painters or the Victorian novelists or even the World War I poets. Uh, so Fitzgerald is associated with a particular phase of history, most notably in the United States, uh, the Jazz Age, a phrase which he himself gave to the age in 1922. He has been linked with other groupings of poets and novelists. Uh, for instance, some Americans refer to the group which left America at the end of the, of the First World War and traveled extensively in Europe and wrote from Europe. They, the Americans refer to them as the lost generation. And he is often grouped with those, notably Hemingway. And then there are other, the French uh, call them uh, the lost years, but referring to the same group. Fitzgerald is associated particularly with the Jazz Age, which we can define as a period between about 1919 and 1929. I'm going to deal with those particular years in some detail, and this is the contents of my talk. I'm going to talk a bit about the Jazz Age, and then about his own life and his works. Uh, I'm going to deal with a, a couple of illnesses. Uh, that's a play on words on my part. Uh, the couple of illnesses are those experienced by the couple, Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. Then I'm going to devote some time to The Great Gatsby as his most important novel. And then uh, I will conclude with some remarks about his life in general. What do we mean by the Jazz Age? Well, it has a, a number of other names. Most importantly, it's often known as the Roaring Twenties. And as I said, it's the period between 1919 and the end of the First World War and 1929. Now, from various academic analyses of the Jazz Age, I've picked out a number of key indicators of what was going on during that particular decade in parts of Europe and in North America, that is both the US and Canada. First of all, it was a sudden return to economic prosperity uh, after the austerity of the First World War. Uh, secondly, a large number of modern consumer items, the washing machine, the electric iron, and various other electrical appliances uh, created a sense of domestic freedom. Uh, people felt they could get out of the house and were not burdened with 24 hour a day housework. And with the rise of individual automobile ownership, um, easier mobility and capacity to move about 
the country and, and the continent in the case of Europe. Thirdly, modern media, uh, most importantly radio and film, created a first ever worldwide entertainment industry and provided people with lots of different specific uses for their leisure time. Uh, so that uh, attendance at cinemas rocketed during the 20s. Uh, radio audiences grew from a few thousand at the beginning of World War I to hundreds of millions by 1929. The reaction to wartime austerity went over into what, looking back on it, we see as a frantic search for enjoyment. Uh, so many people had lost loved ones and had suffered during World War I that it seemed important not to put off any time that you might have for pleasure. And so the frantic search for enjoyment became a characteristic of the jazz age. It was, of course, also the age of prohibition in the United States. Prohibition, as I'm sure you all know, had a very perverse effect on American society. It was supposed to reduce and in fact prohibit access to alcohol and thus to prevent drunkenness and the ill effects of drunkenness on the society. It had the perverse effect of actually encouraging the use of alcohol. Uh, all statistics indicated that the consumption of alcohol rose continuously throughout the 20s, despite its consumption and sale being prohibited. And people also turned to other drugs that were manufactured uh, for particular pleasure purposes. Smoking, as you know, was almost universal as the negative effects of tobacco use had not been researched at all at that time. And smoking was associated with maturity and sophistication. In the United States, there was a very belated discovery by the middle classes, not the working classes, of uh, black art and music. Uh, remember the Civil War is only 50 years in the past at this time. And so uh, the black people as a whole in American society remained oppressed, but black art and music, notably of course jazz, uh, became extremely fashionable in the upper and middle classes. And be, to be favorably inclined towards black music, above all say to be a friend of Louis Armstrong was a sign of liberal attitudes, a rejection of convention and fundamentally anti-establishment. And finally, as you all know probably, there was a massive increase in organized crime during the 1920s and not, not limited to America, but mostly in America. Obviously, uh, violating prohibition was a very important source of crime, but organized crime penetrated all the economic sectors in American society during the 1920s and contributed, of course, to the collapse of the economy in 1929. So those are some of the key points uh, of uh, the, the jazz age or the roaring 20s as it was sometimes called. Fitzgerald, of course, experienced a particular type of jazz age. For him, the jazz age consisted inter alia with the following things. Top of the list, parties with music, dancing and alcohol in, in abundance. And of course, as these parties, especially if they involved alcohol, were illegal, uh, they, they were uh, organized and, and, and generally managed uh, by organized crime. And so even attending a party at a speakeasy, uh, a bar, uh, you were in fact violating the law and liable to criminal prosecution. prosecution. Uh, one critic has comments on, commented on Fitzgerald's obsession with parties, which figure largely in all his novels and especially in The Great Gatsby. I quote, Though Fitzgerald's literary image was daring, non-conformist and unconventional, he never quite extinguished his provincial and puritanical streak. He said to one friend, this is a quote of Fitzgerald himself, for me, parties are a form of suicide. I love them, 
but the old Catholic in me secretly disapproves. So the, the whole element, elements of Fitzgerald's character uh, appear very clearly in that quote and uh, appear very clearly also in his novels, as I will show. Secondly, for him, the 1920s was a search for personal meaning in a rapidly changing society. How to keep up became fundamental to his whole lifestyle and to be seen to be involved in activities which had the social status uh, was how he sought to give personal meaning to his own life. It also caused him to seek status, as I mentioned, and above all, friendships with other artists to consolidate his own view of himself as an artist. It was necessary to be friendly with other artists and also to be seen to be friendly by appearing in the modern media, by being present at film previews, by working in Hollywood and, and other elements of his life, as I'll show you. Uh, the next most important thing to him again was parties with music, dancing and alcohol. He also struggled to maintain appearances in a competitive society. For the first time, people began to keep statistics of what was happening in their society. And the numbers of books sold, for instance, or the attendances at films began to be monitored. And so artists, especially Fitzgerald, came under pressure to be competitive in terms of the number of novels of his that were sold and the number of times that he was seen at film premieres and so on. Obviously, he was not untainted by association with criminals, which was almost impossible to avoid them in American society at that time. And also we see the emergence for the first time of something that's come to be very dominant in our society, sports celebrities. And it's no, it's no coincidence that one of the main characters in The Great Gatsby is one of the early female golfers, professional golfers named Jordan Baker. And then, of course, there were more parties. And then the search to be seen to be active in the new media, to be always on radio, if you possibly could, to be seen to be scripting films, or better still, appearing in them, were also elements of the jazz age that deeply influenced Fitzgerald's own activities. So that gives you an idea of the society in which he was living. I now turn to his own life. Uh, with uh, some dates of events and important information. He was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, you know, on September the 24th, 1896. So he, he just comes right at the end of the Victorian age. And of course, most of his life was lived in a very different society. This is the Fitzgerald House in St. Paul, Minnesota. This is a very impressive house, but I hasten to tell you that the Fitzgerald lived in the little tower block indicated by arrows. Although they were upper, lower, middle class, the middle, middle class perhaps best described them, they certainly didn't own that entire building, which is a, in fact a very elaborate terrace house, but they occupied the, the tower indicated. His father was, was named Edward, and he came from Maryland, and he was an old Southerner through and through with the values and attitudes and prejudices of a Southerner. However, he was not rich. He was in fact quite poor and worked for most of his life as a salesman for the DuPont family, who, who were the front of the early chemical uh, fortunes. His mother, however, was the daughter of an Irish immigrant who became wealthy as a wholesale grocer. And it was the mother's money, money that enabled the Fitzgeralds to maintain a standard in, of living that would qualify as middle, middle class. Fitzgerald said the following about his own origins. I am half black Irish and half old American stock with the usual exaggerated ancestral pretensions the black Irish half of the family had the money and looked down and looked down on the Maryland side of the family who had 
and really had that series of reticences and obligations that go under the poor old shattered word breeding. So his father was very obsessed with family and the origins of his family, while his mother's family were entirely a one gener first generation uh, uh, immigrants to, to enrich and, and through grocery sales. Uh, Fitzgerald was sent to two good schools, but didn't distinguish himself at either of them. Here is a picture of his father, Edward, with the young Scott Fitzgerald, probably in about 1900, I would say, looking at that little boy is probably about four years old. He was undistinguished as a, as a pupil at school, but he did manage to get entrance to Princeton. And he was in the class of 1917. The Americans, as you know, uh, refer to the class of their universities by the class in which they were supposed to graduate. So he entered Princeton in 1914 and would have graduated in 1917. So he's referred to as being in the class of 1917 but he neglected his studies totally. He either participated in sports, as you see, uh, he is there uh, for, fifth from the right or third from the, third from the right or fifth from the left of the tennis team. And he spent most of his time contributing to the literary magazine or else acting in the equivalent of the dramatic society known as the Princeton Triangle Club. He was particularly a star of several musicals during that time. He was unlikely to graduate in 1917, so he didn't even bother to sit the exams. Uh, he joined the army instead and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the infantry. While he was in camp in a place called Montgomery, Alabama in 1916 and 17, uh, he wrote a novel called The Romantic Egotist, which he submitted to the publishers, but which was favorably received, but rejected and sent for revision. Uh, in 1918, he was sent to Camp Sheridan uh, near Montgomery, Alabama. And there he fell in love with the wife that he was to remain married to for all of his life, but the marriage was not happy. She was a very well-known local, local Southern belle named Zelda Sayre. She was regarded as the beauty of her year of deb debutant fame in 1917. As you'll see, she's already begun to smoke herself to death. And uh, she became the object of every officer in the army camp in which uh, Fitzgerald was stationed and he pursued her and affected in the, in, engaged her affections to the point at which she said that she would become engaged to him once he had earned enough money to support them as a couple. From the start, Zelda was a pleasure-seeking, uninhibited member of the, the jazz age. He has a picture of her in costume in the, in the, in the, at the Mystery Ball in Montgomery in 1919. Uh, her life was completely bound up with uh, entertainments, dancers, uh, being a person about town and coming from an extremely wealthy family and therefore not keen on Fitzgerald being married to Fitzgerald until he was earning substantial income. He sent his novel into the publishers, revised for a second time, but it was rejected again for further revision. And he went to New York in 1920 to try to earn enough money in order to offer a, a home to Zelda and a style of living that she was accustomed to. And while he was in New York, she broke off the engagement. At last, in July 1919, his first novel, called This Side of Paradise, was accepted by Scribner's, who published all his other novels. Also, while in New York in 1920, Fitzgerald began a career as a highly successful short story writer in popular magazines. In fact, this was where he earned most of his money for most of his life. 
The Side of Paradise was published on March 26, 1920. And a week later, Zelda Sayre came to New York uh, on the assumption that it would sell very well. And they got married and em embraced a life of young socialites. They spent that summer of 1921 in Westport, Connecticut, and then took an apartment in New York City, where he wrote his second novel, The Side of Paradise, which was also well received, but did not sell in large quantities. So he was not even at the start earning the amount of money that Zelda had anticipated. Nevertheless, uh, at the end of 1922, here is a photograph of them in 1922 as a young married couple. There is a problem in looking at old photographs like this if you already know how the story turns out, because you begin to see in their faces a premonition, a prefiguring of what the character would become. Have a close look at Zelda, uh, and it might think to you as we go on with her story that in this photograph you begin to see the beginning of the end. They then went overseas where he wrote The Beautiful and the Damned, which was also published, well, well received by critics, but did not sell particularly well. And one critic commented that it seemed to be a book about Fitzgerald and his own life. And this was a criticism which he suffered throughout his, his career, that his material was essentially his own activities and his own life, and that he wrote exhaustively uh, about that. He once exclaimed to a reporter, but my God, that was my material, and it was all I had to deal with. Uh, so the autobiographical streak in his novels was seen right from the beginning. In 1921, the daughter, uh, whom they never really parented at all, uh, known as Scotty, was born. And here is a solitary family Christmas photograph that I was able to find of the family in 1922. In the same year, he published the book that gave the name to that age, Tales of the Jazz Age. And you'll see he is listed as the author of The Beautiful and the Damned. So he is beginning to accumulate a reputation by this stage. In the summer of 1923, they stayed in this house on Long Island near New York, which has been preserved as one of the several Fitzgerald museums that exist in, in the United States. And it was this type of house that he had in mind when writing The Great Gatsby. This was the kind of house in which the Buchanans rented and which the narrator Nick Carraway lived. Gatsby, of course, lived in a much larger house than this. This is Fitzgerald, a, a studio portrait of him in 1923 or 4, maybe as late as 1925. And it goes very well with the description of a reporter who wrote a story about him at this time. I quote, Scott was a man who looked like a boy with a face between handsome and pretty. He had fair wavy hair, a high forehead, excited and friendly eyes, and a delicate long-lipped Irish mouth that on a girl would have been the mouth of a beauty. His chin was well built and he had good ears and a handsome, almost beautiful, unmarked face. The mouth worried you until you knew him, and then it worried you more. And again, maybe the intimations of what was to come uh, are seen in the, in the photograph already. In 1924, they went to Europe, and there he wrote The Great Gatsby, by far, far and away his most famous novel. Uh, the stay in Europe was marred by the fact that Zelda had an affair with a, a French pilot, a, a French ace of the First World War. In Europe, they became very friendly with Ernest Hemingway, senior with Fitzgerald in Paris. 
uh, and a little exchange between the two of them is quite interesting because once Fitzgerald, who was obsessed, as you gather by now, with money and as well as fame and social standing, uh, once Fitzgerald said to Hemingway, you know, Ernest, the rich are really different people to us. And Hemingway in his flat earthy style said, yes, Scott, they have more money. And the difference between the two writers uh, is very clearly summed up in that little exchange. Here we see Zelda and Scott in the mid twenties, perhaps 25, 26, attending one of the endless dinners, parties, film previews, etc., that they were always seen at. Again, you might be begin to see in their faces some element of original usefulness being lost, uh, some puffiness in the faces perhaps as a result of their uninhibited lifestyle, uh, use of alcohol and drugs, and in, of course in, in continuous uh, smoking. In the early 1930s, they rented a house in Baltimore they almost always lived in rented accommodation. They very seldom, in fact, not in his entire life did they actually buy a house. And they rented very posh houses, as you can see from this living room. And it was in this living room that he wrote his fourth novel, uh, Tender is the Night, which was published in 1934. Uh, here is a first edition of Tender is the Night with a little note to an unknown person, or unknown to me anyway, called Claire, or to her parents. Uh, knowing her, I hope you'll find something to like in this. Best wishes from F. Scott Fitzgerald. Again, tender is the night, a, a phrase taken from one of Keats's poems, uh, was a critical success, but not a commercial success. It's his most ambitious novel, and again, it's written very much from his own experience. It tells the story of the deterioration of a main character known as Dick Diver, uh, a brilliant American psychiatrist who is married to a very wealthy mental patient. Because by that stage, uh, the mental health of Zelda began to be called into question. And they entered a life which from about 1935 onwards, she was in and out of sanatoriums uh, and under various forms of psychiatric treatment for the rest of her life. The period towards his death was the most difficult period of his, of his entire life. And he called the years 1936 and 1937, the crack up. It's a series of essays about the jazz age and about his own life in the jazz age and indicates his mental and physical deterioration related to the lifestyle which he and, and Zelda had followed for all their lives. He, he began writing screenplays in Hollywood in 1936 but was not very good at it, a screenplay being extremely difficult art to master and very different to novels but he was credited with a number of screenplays and paid rather handsomely by the standards of the late 30s uh, because of his, his reputation as a novelist. In 1936, Zelda entered a, a psychiatric hospital called Highland Hospital and was treated there virtually for the rest of her life. This is a, a picture of him in 1937. You'll see that he still retains the, the good looks of his youth and did so almost to the end of his life. Although, as I've indicated, marks of his uninhibited lifestyle can be seen in many photographs. He had to continue working in Hollywood and writing short stories to meet the hospitalization fees of his wife, Zelda and uh, very little earnings were coming in from his novels unfortunately even the great gatsby and he had to subsist more or less on the basis of 
publishing work that he had previously completed the previous day, as it were, and receiving the check the next day, which immediately went to pay for her psychiatric treatment. Here she is a photograph of her taken in 1937. And again, you may see the sort of haunted expression on her face and, and the oblique look at the camera from, from her eyes, uh, indicating perhaps her mental state. While he, we, she was in psychiatric hospital and he was in Hollywood trying to earn money to pay for her to be there, he met and fell in love with Sheila Graham, a, a columnist, a gossip columnist, as they were called in those days, who wrote a daily column in the local newspaper about the comings and goings of people like Fitzgerald and, and other and then movie stars. And she once commented of him, and I quote, when Scott was drunk, he would have made love to a tree, uh, indicating a certain detachment from him, even though she allowed him to stay in her house uh, until he died. In 1939, he started work on The Last Tycoon, now republished as The Love of the Last Tycoon in 1939, but he never completed the book. He died on the 21st of December, 1940, aged 44. Uh, there is his, uh, the, the New York Times notice of his death. All the sad young men, those now grown up members of the World War generation had lost their spokesman yesterday. F. Scott Fitzgerald died of a heart attack in Hollywood at the age of 44. Zelda lived on in various institutions uh, for another eight years and she died in 1948 in a fire in the uh, Highland Hospital, uh, a picture of which is in the lower right hand corner of this image. They were buried in the same grave. She was subsequently buried in his grave, Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald, 1896 to 1940, and Zelda Sayre, 1900 to 1948. F. Scott Fitzgerald undoubtedly died, believing himself to be a failure. I'm now going to deal with a couple of illnesses that are associated with Zelda and Scott Fitzgerald. There have been three phases of medical diagnosis of Scott's problems. Obviously, the most, the most obvious manifestation was alcoholism. Uh, but he's been seen by various medical personalities as being of an addictive personality. That is to say, a person who has a predisposition to become obsessed by particular phenomena or particular forms of life or even particular persons and is closely related to what we call obsessive compulsive disorder. So he had an addictive personality, which explains his alcoholism. One medical source believes that he suffered from temporal lobe epilepsy. That is, uh, he was subject to seizures uh, brought on by irregular electrical activity in the temporal lobes of the brain, which caused him to behave in a very uninhibited and, and extremely dangerous ways. Uh, often actually seeking out danger and criminality as part of his activity. But more convincing is the idea that he suffered from fairly, uh, fairly well-known disorder, hyperglycemia, that is excess alcohol in, uh, excess glucose in the blood. He also had excess alcohol in the blood very often. Excess glucose in the blood and is manifested by breathing difficulties, nausea, vomiting, confusion, and kidney and heart complications. So it's no, no surprise that he died of a heart attack. And, and hyperglycemia is, is exacerbated by the consumption of alcohol. Zelda was originally 
diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, the same diagnosis, ironically, as John Nash in A Beautiful Mind, and was treated in the same way early on by insulin-induced insulin convulsions, which predated electroconvulsive therapy. Later, however, it, was gen it is generally agreed that she suffered from bipolar disorder, uh, but because the drugs were not available, lithium had not even been discovered at that stage as a medication for bipolar disorder that only occurred in 1949. She was never properly medicated and therefore never recovered from her alternating manic and depressive phases. So they, they were both dogged by illness, but certainly their illnesses were both the cause of and the result of the lifestyle that they followed for most of their lives. Ernest Hemingway has left this description of a meeting with Scott Fitzgerald, which indicates the effect, one of the effects that alcohol had on him. The first time I ever met Scott Fitzgerald, a very strange thing happened. We were in a bar drinking together. As Scott sat there at the bar holding the glass of champagne, the skin seemed to, to tighten over his face until all the puffiness was gone. And then it drew tighter until the face was like a death's head. The eyes sank and began to look dead and the lips were drawn tight and the color left the face so that it was the color of used candle wax. This was not my imagination. His face became a true death's head or death mask in front of my eyes. And it's on the basis of that, that uh, the, the, the diagnosis of epilepsy has been mooted by particular medical specialists. I'm now going to talk a bit about The Great Gatsby, the novel for which he is most famous. Let's have a look at some of the statistics. It was not a commercial success. During for Fitzgerald's life, that is between 1924 and 1940, the great Scatsby earned royalties of the huge sum of $8,400. The 1926 film that was made of it uh, netted $19,000 for, for Scott Fitzgerald as the author of the novel. The, the, the film rights were purchased for $19,000. So $27,400 was the total amount he earned from the Great Gatsby during his life. His, the current income from the Great Gatsby that goes to his heirs, that is his daughter Scotty's children, from all sources is about half a million dollars a year. So you'll see that, that his commercial success came years after he had died. The book has been translated into 42 languages. Uh, as of the end of last year, it had sold approximately 31 million copies and its position on the Wikipedia list of all the best-selling novels ever is 50th. If for your interest, you might want to know that the 49th is the very recent novel, The Kite Runner, and the 51st is the famous novel Gone with the Wind. So it's lodged between um, The Kite Runner and Gone with the Wind as the 50th best-selling novel of all time. On average, it sells annually each year now about a half a million books, together with more recently about 185,000 ebooks of The Great Gatsby per year. So it's selling six to 700,000 copies a year in, in both print and ebook form, as against the ludicrously small numbers it sold during his lifetime. I'm going to talk about the novel briefly by looking at the narrative structure at some of the characters, at the social comment in the novel, and then the themes. However, I just want to add at this point that undoubtedly much of the popularity and sales of The Great Gatsby is caused by the fact that it is prescribed virtually everywhere in America at high school and college level, university level, as a set book for reading in the first year of study. That is to say the 
12th grade of the high school and the first year of university study. And many of them, of the readers, don't read the book, I'm afraid to say. They resort to the notes on the book that are now ubiquitous throughout the university and high school world as a substitute for actually reading the book. And I thought you might like a taste of the kind of introduction to the great Gatsby that the average high school student or university college student might get. This is from the most famous of the series of notes that help you not to read the book called the Sparks Notes. This is how the Sparks Notes deal with the narrative of the great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby is about the efforts of this one man, Jay Gatsby, to reinvent himself. The narrator of the story is Nick Carraway, who moves out to New York from the Midwest and ends up living next door to Gatsby. We see the whole story from Nick's point of view, as he meets people in New York's wealthy social scene and gradually gets to know Gatsby. Nick kind of falls in love with Gatsby and what he represents. Gatsby is an irrepressible dreamer. He has a really extravagant lifestyle and throws incredible parties. But this persona is completely his own invention. He actually grew up poor, and his real name isn't even Gatsby, it's James Gatz. Years earlier, he fell in love with a rich girl named Daisy, and couldn't marry her because he didn't have any money. The book is set in the summer of 1922. At the beginning of the story, Nick Carraway moves to New York from the Midwest to begin his career selling bonds. He works in Manhattan, but he rents a little house way out on Long Island in the town of West Egg. His house is next door to a giant mansion. Nick goes to see Daisy and Tom, some rich friends he knows from the Midwest who now live in nearby East Egg, Long Island. Over dinner, he picks up on the fact that Daisy is unhappy in her marriage and that Tom has a girlfriend. He also meets Jordan Baker, a famous golfer, whom he starts dating a little later in the book. Later that evening, after he goes home, he sees his next door neighbor, Mr. Gatsby, looking out over the water in the direction of Tom and Daisy's house. There's a green light on the dock by Daisy's house that you can just see. To get back and forth between West Egg and Manhattan, Nick has to pass through an ugly and depressing area filled with ash heaps. There's a gas station in this area and a billboard with big eyes on it advertising an optometrist. One Sunday, when Nick is on the train in this area headed to Manhattan, Tom makes him get off and meet his girlfriend Myrtle. Myrtle is married to the man who owns the gas station and she lives above a garage Tom keeps an apartment in the city where he sees Myrtle. They all go there and have a party. Nick winds up going home with another man, a photographer named Mr. McKee. At the mansion next door to Nick's, parties go on all night long, every night. One day, Gatsby's chauffeur delivers an invitation to Nick from Gatsby, so Nick goes to one of the parties. Crowds of people come, drink heavily, and dance. He sees Jordan Baker there, and the two of them stick together. He meets Gatsby, and they talk about their shared experiences in Europe and World War I. Gatsby is nice to Nick, and they strike up a friendship. One day in July, Gatsby drives Nick into the city. On the way, he tells Nick about how he went to Oxford, because it's a family tradition, and how he inherited a lot of money, and spent time hunting big game, and collecting rubies, and trying to get over something sad that happened to him. It sounds bogus, and Nick doesn't know whether to believe him. Gatsby tells Nick he's going to ask him for a favor that day, but that Jordan Baker is going to explain it. They have lunch with a man. I think you can probably get the idea from that, what the Spark Notes do to the book, reducing it to its very barest essentials of who said what to whom and at what event. Now the characters, Tom and Daisy Buchanan, represent in the book the rich that are different to the rest of society. They are portrayed as using their wealth to isolate themselves from the realities of the society and to escape the consequences of their deeds. George and Myrtle Wilson, trapped in that valley of ashes, are portrayed as the victims of the coming economic depression of the, in the United States, uh, trapped in a lower, lower class occupation and living in an, an unhealthy environment. Jordan Baker, as I mentioned already, portrays the growing importance of professional 
sports people in American society. The hero, Gates, Jay Gatsby, is in a sense both Scott Fitzgerald and not Scott Fitzgerald. He is Scott Fitzgerald insofar as he is pursuing a dream of wealth, of being able to recreate himself as a new person continuously and by li and living in the level of society uh, which is although permeated by crime uh, far and above the average standard of living. Nick Carraway is the narrator of the book. He comes from the Middle West and in terms of American symbolism this means he is relatively honest and relatively uh, unsophisticated and during his summer that he spends in New York and meets Gatsby and all the other characters, he loses his illusions about the American dream of wealth and prosperity and an easy life and becomes more adjusted to the reality of his society. Uh, I have tried to portray or give you some sense of the novel by using a something that I haven't tried before, a situation in which the, the book words of the novel are read to you over a rolling text so that you can both read them yourself and hear them read because there's no doubt that The Great Gatsby is a novel written in the American accent. It really benefits a great deal from being rendered in an accent of the natives of that country. The themes obviously are what is human self, what, what is humanity, what are the elements of humanity that lead to destruction or to salvation. It's an analysis of the American dream of ease, leisure, wealth and uh, safety and shows how illusory this is and how it can only be achieved by suppressing others. And then it is an analysis of American society in the 1920s that has seldom been surpassed. Chapter 1 In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you've had. He didn't say any more, but we've always been unusually communicative in a reserved way. And I understand that he meant a great deal more than that. In consequence, I am inclined to reserve all judgments, a habit that has opened up many curious natures to me and also made me the victim of not a few veteran bores. The abnormal mind is quick to detect and attach itself to this quality when it appears in a normal person. And so it came about that in college I was unjustly accused of being a politician because I was privy to the secret griefs of wild, unknown men. Most of the confidences were unsought. Frequently, I have feigned sleep, preoccupation, or a hostile levity when I realized by some unmistakable sign that an intimate revelation was quivering on the horizon. For the intimate revelations of young men, or at least the terms in which they express them, are usually plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppressions. Reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope. I am still a little afraid of missing something if I forget that, as my father snobbishly suggested, and I snobbishly repeat, a sense of the fundamental decencies is parceled out unequally at birth. And after boasting this way of my tolerance, I come to the admission that it has a limit. Conduct may be founded on the hard rock or the wet marshes, but after a certain point I don't care what it's founded on. When I came back from the East last autumn, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and at a sort of moral attention forever. I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby, the man who gives his name to this book, was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I have an unaffected scorn. If personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about him some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. This responsiveness had nothing to do with that flabby impressionability which is dignified under the name of the creative temperament. 
It was an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person and which it is not likely I shall ever find again. No, Gatsby turned out all right at the end. It is what preyed on Gatsby, what foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. Uh, the next extract that I have read is, describes the parties. Uh, I think you'll see how Fitzgerald is able to render the, the nature of, of the particular parties in his own life very well. My neighbor's house through the summer nights. In his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whisperings and the champagne and the stars. At high tide in the afternoon, I watched his guests diving from the tower of his raft or taking the sun on the hot sand of his beach while his two motorboats slit the waters of the sound, drawing aquaplanes over cataracts of foam. On weekends, his Rolls Royce became an omnibus, bearing parties to and from the city between nine in the morning and long past midnight, while his station wagon scampered like a brisk yellow bug to meet all trains. And on Mondays, eight servants, including an extra gardener, toiled all day with mops and scrubbing brushes and hammers and garden shears, repairing the ravages of the night before. Every Friday, five crates of oranges and lemons arrived from a fruiterer in New York. Every Monday, these same oranges and lemons left his back door in a pyramid of pulpless halves. There was a machine in the kitchen which could extract the juice of 200 oranges in half an hour if a little button was pressed 200 times by a butler's thumb. At least once a fortnight, a corps of caterers came down with several hundred feet of canvas and enough colored lights to make a Christmas tree of Gatsby's enormous garden. On buffet tables, garnished with glistening hors d'oeuvres, spiced baked hams crowded against salads of harlequin designs and pastry pigs and turkeys bewitched to a dark gold. In the main hall, a bar with a real brass rail was set up and stocked with gins and liquors and with cordials so long forgotten that most of his female guests were too young to know one from another. By seven o'clock the orchestra had arrived. No thin five-piece affair, but a whole pitful of oboes and trombones and saxophones and viols and cornets and piccolos and low and high drums. The last swimmers have come in from the beach now and are dressing upstairs. The cars from New York are parked five deep in the drive, and already the halls and salons and verandas are gaudy with primary colors and hair shorn in strange new ways and shawls beyond the dreams of Castile. The bar is in full swing and floating rounds of cocktails permeate the garden outside until the air is alive with chatter and laughter and casual innuendo and introductions forgotten on the spot and enthusiastic meetings between women who never knew each other's names. The lights grow brighter as the earth lurches away from the sun, and now the orchestra is playing yellow cocktail music, and the opera of voices pitches a key higher. Laughter is easier, minute by minute, spilled with prodigality, tipped out at a cheerful word. The groups change more swiftly, swell with new arrivals, dissolve and form in the same breath, Already there are wanderers, confident girls who weave here and there among the stouter and more stable, become for a sharp, joyous moment the center of a group, and then excited with triumph, glide on through the sea change of faces and voices and color under the constantly changing light. Suddenly, one of these gypsies in trembling opal seizes a cocktail out of the air, drops it down for courage, and moving her hands like Frisco, dances out alone onto the canvas platform. A momentary hush. The orchestra leader varies his rhythm obligingly for her, and there is a burst of chatter as the erroneous news goes around that she is Gilda Gray's understudy from the Follies. The party has begun. And now I'm just going to read you the end of the novel, and we'll conclude there. At the end, after Gatsby has been killed by Wilson, Nick spends his last night sitting on the shore. He writes as follows, most of the big shore places were closed now and there were hardly any lights except the shadowy moving glow of a ferry boat across the sound. And as the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away. 
until gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, the fresh green breast of the new world, its vanished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house, had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. And as I sat there brooding on the old unknown world, I thought of Gatsby's wonder when he first picked out the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. He had come a long way to this blue lawn and his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him. Somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city, where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster stretch out our arms farther, and one fine morning, and so we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. We can reach some conclusions uh, about the status of Fitzgerald as a novelist and about the way in which he portrays American society. These are the conclusions that arise from my research. First of all, he is typical of a group of late 19th and early 20th century artists. The aspects which are relevant here are first of all, he's being relatively unsuccessful in his career and only appreciated after his death. Secondly, his being unable to integrate himself into the society in which he was living through, for a number of reasons and remaining something of an outcast and trying to enter into the social life of his times. Secondly, he relies very heavily on turning his own life experiences into fiction. He does not research his novels and certainly does not attempt any historical element in his novels that might require research. Rather, he documented his own life extensively and was something of a nuisance to other people in asking them for their opinions after an event which he had documented and later turned into fiction. Thirdly, he has come to symbolize an age and a particular phenomenon. In his case, as I've argued throughout this presentation, he has symbolized the jazz age and the various phenomena that are characteristic of that age. I've previously outlined all of these. And finally, although he was not greatly appreciated in his own life, his reputation has grown dramatically after his death, and in his case, especially after the Second World War. He, his reputation has been increased to a certain extent by a general readership, but more importantly by the book, especially The Great Gatsby, becoming a set work for high school and college students in the modern times and therefore selling large numbers of copies, not all of which I'm afraid to say will have been read because as I've indicated, many of these are mostly accessed by the students through summaries or notes about the book. Perhaps the best way in which he has become widely acknowledged are the films which he has been, have been made of all his books. Uh, both 
the beautiful and the damned and this side of paradise have been filmed twice. The Great Gatsby has been filmed three times and the last tycoon or uh, is in the process of being filmed for a third time as I speak. It will appear in 2022 under the title of Loves of the Lost Tycoon. So he's firmly established as a, an integral part of 20th century literature. And for those who have not read his books, I strongly recommend that you obtain them from your library and read them. I'm sure that you will enjoy them. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. That, that was fascinating. So interesting to see how his life is actually mirrored in his work, particularly in Gatsby. I'm sure Robin would like to have some comments and some questions. May I ask a question? Two, in fact. Robin, first of all, didn't say anything about her, but can you comment at all on Gerald's relationship with Dorothy Parker? Um, and the second question is, um, is there, do you see any parallel between the jazz age and the age just post the Second World War, um, say the late 40s, early 50s, in, in Europe, where there must have been much the same sort of feelings going on um, at the end of a war. Okay, uh, the two questions there, Dorothy Parker, well, the, of course the Fitzgeralds were friendly with her. Dorothy Parker was a novelist herself, but was better known as a columnist in the New Yorker and other magazines. I, I haven't information about their ongoing relationships but I do know of a uh, recorded in one of the biographies of Fitzgerald that she was one of the few people who visited the funeral parlor where he was in, in his coffin lying uh, for people to pay their respects. And Dorothy Parker was heard to say as she stood facing the, ca the, the coffin, oh, that poor son of a bitch. That, that's the extent of my knowledge of your relationship. And I presume that son of a bitch is an American phrase which can convey both hostility and praise. American generals generally call themselves, you know, tough sons of a bitch. The, the 1920s, there are similarities, of course, every war breeds a reaction in terms of which people go against the uh, austerity of the war and the restrictions that are post obviously posed to human freedom during a war. But th there would seem to be an intensity and a self-destructive capacity in the 1920s, which was absent from the late 1940s and early 1950s. And uh, the element of criminal involvement uh, was something which Roosevelt had been able to contain during the Second World War. Uh, so that there wasn't a widespread criminal corruption of the war effort, as there was a wide, widespread criminal corruption of life in the 1920s. So I think there was an intensity and an, an involvement of organized crime in the first period, the 20s, that was not present in the second period. Thank you. Yeah, I, I believe that um, Dorothy Parker did mention at some stage, it, it's in one of the biographies, that um, she spent a weekend away with Fitzgerald at some stage, but whether that is true or not, I don't know. I think her remark was more sympathetic, that he, that he <laughs> hadn't got his due set of fame and his due set of wealth that he should have got. He was a poor son of a bitch. I think what is captured so magnificently in Gatsby is that sense of romantic readiness. It's beautifully captured. And uh, Nick, of course, is, is, uh, is such an interesting character because he is the outsider, the observer who can be detached and comment. And the fact that he's not, that he's from the West, but that there's almost a sense of a different ethical standard. That's so beautifully used to to give us an insight into that world and Gatsby's role in it and the lovely use of, of language you know talking about yellow music and 
Blue Lawns. I find it a most brilliant novel. Thank you so much for, for bringing it to life for us. I hope you enjoyed the readings. I, I, was I did. Very much helped by John Taylor in getting those. But it does, I think it does make a difference to hear it in the yes, vernacular, it as it were. It's a foreign language, actually. Robin, did his daughter ever say anything about him? And did she herself do something of importance? When I said that they, they barely parented her, I, I was basically referring to the fact that as soon as possible, they consigned her to boarding schools and she was alienated from them because of their lifestyle and basically uh, grew up quite separate from Scott and Zelda. Uh, she did write about her parents, but it was quite muted and she devoted most of her life to ensuring the establishment of a trust that would get the income that she was certain would accrue to her husband, uh, to her father, as people discovered his novels. And all the rights, all the film rights, all the novel rights, all the short story rights are vested in this trust. And as I mentioned, the trust has an income of about half a million dollars per annum now, which is, which is set up to benefit her children. So while she was alienated from them as a child and, and as, a, as a young adult, uh, in her lifetime, she realized that he had merit that would be recognized by other people. And she took a lot of trouble to set up the right financial mechanisms and legal mechanisms to ensure that his family at least benefited from his work. Uh, and Martin here. It's been, uh, I think I did read it years ago at school. It's been on book lists in schools in the UK, here in South Africa, and obviously in America as well. What has made it so, uh, last so long as a major book to be written in the English classes? What are the, the things that, that the teachers are trying to get the, the kids who take out of the book? I've got a, a proper answer to that and an improper one. The, the proper answer is that it deals with a phenomenon which is declining now, but which was very strong in the latter half of the 20th century. And that is the achievement of what is referred to as the American dream. Uh, in other words, the conviction that it was possible to create a society in which everyone was equal, that there was low levels of crime, high levels of prosperity, and uh, satisfaction was experienced by most of the citizens. Uh, the, the, reason for, the reasons for this uh, were generally arise out of the fact that it was an immigrant country, that they had, as it were, possessed this country, and that they were entitled to live well in it. And, and this dream has persisted in the United States until quite recently. So I think thematically, the book is used educationally to acquaint younger people with the existence of the longing and hope that American society once had to be equal and tolerant and prosperous and a world state all at the same time. Time is, is proving that to be impossible, but it lingers on very strongly, thematically. From a point of view of literary instruction, where, you, where you, you're teaching people to study literature, the most dominant theme has been the role of the narrator. It's a, it's a classic example of how a novelist can place himself in the role of a narrator of a story and show how that narrator is himself able to perceive the inadequacies of his society, that he starts out innocent and becomes disillusioned, but not incapacitated by his, his adult experiences. So it's, it's a way of getting people to understand how a novel is written and, and how an, a novelist can use a character in the story 
as a means of instructing people how to become more, more mature, less obviously innocent, more perceptive of the reality which surrounds them. And so the, the, those are the, the reasons which if you read any set of notes which deals with the book as a set book, a prescribed book, that's what it deals with. My lesson proper is that I think most of the people who prescribe the book are under the illusion that most of it is about parties and drinking and drug taking. And then that will appeal to young people because they are drinking and partying and drug taking. And, and therefore it's a book which young people will identify with and want to read. Of course, the book isn't like that at all. It's a denunciation of that kind of life. It's, what, it's, it's the foul dust that lingers in Gatsby's wake. But I think many people who prescribe books think, my, my heavens, what sort of book will young people actually read? What is it about? What, what events occur in it that they can identify with? And they say, ah, oh, the great Gatsby. Uh, that's all about parties and drinking and taking drugs and having a great time. And that children, uh, young people will identify that. Let's prescribe that. It's also a good novel, so let's prescribe it also. So uh, I, th I think there's a mixture of motives that go into prescribing it. The other book that, whose popularity is almost is solely ensured by being a prescribed book uh, is uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, which is the most prescribed book in American educational history followed by The Great Gatsby. Now, they couldn't be more different. The Killer Mockingbird has a very serious theme and very serious and horrible events occur in it. And it's designed to instruct people about race relations, uh, obviously a major topic in American society. The Gatsby is a completely different book and uh, is prescribed for completely different reasons. I think Robin's view is a little bit cynical about reasons for for but those are very sound. And look, it is it is a brilliantly written novel. So I think there's also a lot of nostalgia, and the the idea of the American dream remains very very strong. Americans will tell you anybody can become president. Why anyone should want to become president, of course, is a different matter, especially if you. <laughs> see what a mess they make of things. But there is this American dream that anybody can make it. And I think that nostalgia for that is very strong in, in Gatsby. It is, it's a very important thing. I think I'll have to go back and get it out again and uh, read it again and appreciate it a bit more. Thank you very much. It's a brilliant read. Anyone who chooses to read it now for the first time, I guarantee you'll be electrified. Robin, thank you so much for this presentation this morning and for, for bringing our anniversary course to such a fantastic ending with this very interesting character and the look into such a fascinating period of our history, well, American history in particular, the whole jazz age, the flappers, the roaring twenties, the whole sense of it so vividly captured. Thank you very much for that, Robin.